for a TED-like talk on the topic of intellectual curiosity. I'm very happy and proud to welcome Dr. Bob Batchelor. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being here, and thanks for giving us this opportunity to speak this afternoon. So, an easy question. What is this? Question mark. Question mark. Question mark. Okay. So, we didn't overthink that. Yes, it's a question mark. <laughs> but, to my eight-year-old daughter, Cassie, that's not a question mark. That's a mystery. To her, the idea of a question mark doesn't exist. When she sees this, she thinks mystery. You can imagine my pride in that answer. When my daughter exhibits in her understanding of a question mark in this drawing, so I said, show me your mystery, and this is what I got. She's just eight. She has nonconformist parents. The education system hasn't yet educated the creativity, the curiosity, or the wonder out of her. My daughter's sense of exploration stands in stark contrast to what educators all over the world are seeing in their classrooms. And more importantly, this is what many professionals in the work world are confronted with when engaging young, young employees. As students and then as professionals, a large percentage of young people are not demonstrating any level of intellectual curiosity. And what you might immediately recognize by my tone of voice and the way that I tell this initial story is that I fear the imminent death of intellectual curiosity. The irony in this narrative is that the decline of critical and contextual thinking is happening at the exact same moment when people have more information at their fingertips than ever before. Yet, what people do with all this information is amuse themselves. They look at endless YouTube videos of celebrities, and cats, and cat celebrities, <laughs> and devil babies rampaging across New York City. One might assume that I'm going to argue against technology. But I don't think it's that easy. Instead, we simply need to help young people understand that they need to carve time out of their lives for critical reflection that will enable them to see the context in with which they live. I used to tell students what they really needed to do, what would benefit them more than going to my classes or any other class, was just take your cell phone, take your computer, take your other devices, Put them in the closet, sit on your bed for 10 or 15 minutes a day with no distraction. You can imagine their response after they stop laughing at me. It's just a blank stare and that yeah right feeling that we all get from millennials. Undaunted, what I tell them today is leave the devices on the bed. Lock yourself in the closet <laughs> and just spend a few quiet, dark moments alone with yourself. But it would blow their minds. This is my interpretation of what would happen to our young minds if they followed my prescription. So what's the value of intellectual curiosity? How do we sell this? Because we are in the, in the, the profession of selling things to various stakeholders. A 2011 meta-study on academic performance by Sophie Van Stum at the University of Edinburgh and two of her co-authors revealed what we all might think. Intelligence is the primary factor that drives success. But what this groundbreaking study did was also verify that curiosity and effort equal intelligence in determining success. The results supported what thinkers have believed about intellectual curiosity dating back to Aristotle and Cicero and going straight on through to modern education theorists like John Dewey. Here's a quote from John Dewey. In a few people, intellectual curiosity is so insatiable that nothing will discourage it, but in most, its edge is easily dulled and blunted. Some lose it in indifference or carelessness, others in a frivolous flippancy. Many escape these evils only to become encased in a hard dogmatism which is equally fatal to the spirit of wonder. 
That's the spirit that I don't want my eight-year-old daughter to lose, the spirit of wonder. When she draws, she fills every single square millimeter of the paper. I just draw stick figures, and the whole paper is white. She <laughs> fills it with color. Communication scholar Brian Kogan, on a panel with me a couple years ago, put the need for intellectual curiosity in a more direct light. He said, quote, we're not just training students for their first careers. We're training them for five or six jobs into the future. And you know what? Some of those jobs don't even exist today. Let's look at this from an even more practical way. Jim Whitehurst, the CEO of the software giant Red Hat, dis defines intellectual curiosity as the single most important trait in hiring new employees, and particularly executives. He says, quote, I'm looking for people who are thoughtful and eager to learn new things. I want to hire people who can achieve and think beyond the role they're interviewing for and understand how that role fits into the bigger company picture. For instance, if I'm talking to someone who's being considered for a finance position, I'll ask questions about their current company, but in areas totally outside their current job. I want to know if they're curious about the business and industry, and if they are simply there to perform their designated role without genuinely understanding what their company does. It's not eggheads like me, or eggheads like any of us in this room that should be the final stopping point of intellectual curiosity. Business leaders are seeing this, lawyers are seeing this, doctors are seeing this. There needs to be a wave of intellectual curiosity, and we need to lead that charge. How, white, how might we demonstrate intellectual curiosity? Personally, I try to demonstrate intellectual curiosity by being a public intellectual. And sometimes when you're a public intellectual, you have to take a stand on things that puts you outside the bounds of what is considered okay or normal or acceptable. So I'm a person that teaches public relations, but I study popular culture. Because popular culture gives me the, aim or the endless bounds that I can explore film, novel, memoir, TV programs, art, drama, and all the accompanying imagery that goes along with those things that are diffused through mass media. These objects play an important role in determining the central narratives or stories that compromise life, comprise life in contemporary America. And I tell my, my students, if you want to understand public relations, watch more TV, watch more movies, and think about what it means. Because people communicate through stories. We are storytellers. No matter the profession, we are storytellers. Scholar Ray Brown described popular culture as, quote, our total life picture. He urged us to read the cultural tea leaves all around us for clues regarding, quote, the lifeblood of daily existence, the way of life, the voice of democracy. Popular culture is democracy. And heck, if we can reach students by engaging in their popular culture, then maybe they'll listen to us and they won't give us that, what are you telling me? look that we're all too familiar with, their, with today's students. Further scrutiny into these interrelated aspects of mass communications for today's audiences reveals that culture both reaches back into the past, it tells us what we're doing today, and it allows us to create the narrative for the future. We can't create worldviews without intellectual curiosity. Without intellectual curiosity, we fall back. We outsource our worldview to our parents, to our friends. But what we instead need to do is take an active role in creating our own personal worldviews. Scholar Maxine Green, one of the greatest minds in contemporary education theory, says, quote, we need to hold in mind the fact that the arts are almost always inexhaustible. There's no using up of a painting or a concerto or a poem. If they have any richness, say destiny at all, they're inexhaustible. There's always more. That idea of more rationalizes the study of popular culture. Films, television, music, and other mass media channels reveal and help establish a population's beliefs and principles. It allows us to craft the stories that we all engage in and use to communicate with one another. I'm also fully aware that this bent toward the humanities and scholarly learning might seem far removed from the quote unquote real world dubious real world, the scary real world that confronts young professionals and their parents who are frantic over what are you going to do with that? 
So in response to that thought, I figured I've taught thousands of students. I'll contact a couple of young professionals and see how has intellectual curiosity played a role in your life. So, Tori tells me, intellectual curiosity engages me to ask questions, ask more questions, ask better questions. It also gives me the courage to try new things like working at a startup where I'm constantly challenged and working to solve new problems as they arise. At work, it helps me gain a reputation for living both in and between departments. In my case, digital marketing, engineering, product management, because I ask questions. Melanie, who's about to take her first tenure track job as a professor, tells me, my intellectual curiosity led to my career path. Although being a professor was never on my career radar, I fell into it when I realized I was constantly seeking new knowledge as a practitioner. Wanting to know more about communication phenomena, I ended up in a master's program where I thought I was setting the foundation for my professional life working in professional sports. Instead, I realized that I truly, what I truly loved was not only seeking, but also creating new knowledge. This intellectual curiosity has forced me to push at to create new boundaries of knowledge gathering, creating and sharing in both personal and professional life. Anne tells me, and she lives in Seattle and drinks a lot of caffeine, so her, her writing reflects that, but she's brilliant. While I love my job, if I could be paid to be a student for life, I'd do it. Because I love learning, I love hearing stories and taking notes and answering questions. Even surrounded by, by my insanely talented and experienced colleagues at Weber Shandwick. If I can pose the so what questions at the right time and in the right place, then my insatiable curiosity to learn and test boundaries and challenge the status quo might just make us all a bit smarter. Intellectual curiosity makes our strategy stronger, our tactics more creative, and our client deliverables more demonstrative of return on investment. Meg tells me, I owe my entire career in social media marketing to intellectual curiosity. It's as simple as that. In a field that changes every day, professionals sink when they do not have the discipline to proactively read the news, analyze trends, and reach out to thought leaders. Through an independent study in college, I used social and digital tools to investigate and study the marketing landscape and shared my thoughts with others online through Twitter and my blog. This ultimately helped me secure a position in an agency where I served as the youngest account manager in a company history for clients such as Walt Disney Studios, ABC Family, NBC Universal, Lionsgate Studios, and Energizer, which gave me experience necessary to cultivate a successful and incredibly fun career path over the past five years. So what does intellectual curiosity do for successful young people? Among other things, it enables them to become lifelong learners, gain confidence, ask questions, inspire others, cultivate talent in themselves and those around them, and it increases their creativity and innovation. Yet here we are. Perhaps we stand facing a watershed moment for intellectualism in the United States. Not unlike any other epic moment in the nation's history, ranging from intervention into war, to other domestic challenges like race relations and women's rights. Closer to home, we see the outcomes of a lack of public discourse from, school, from reports of schools failing under the current standardized management paradigm, to neighborhoods chock full of foreclosed homes, while the global banking system receives public funds to prop up its operations. They are quote unquote too big to fail, while the people funding the system are too small a matter. Let's put it bluntly, the forces lined up against intellectualism are winning. And in my more aggressive state, I said to my wife last night, it's not that just the forces lined up, it's that the dummies are winning. But she said that's way too aggressive for this. So I changed it. We are the last stand. We're the last stand. But I thought, maybe I should be balanced here. What's the downside of intellectual curiosity? Um, oh yeah, there aren't any. Let me tell you about one of the happiest days of my academic life. I taught a course in public relations writing at the University of South Florida. It's one of the largest schools in the country. I attempted to get them to think about professional writing via storytelling, because I've already told you my bias about storytelling. 
I liberally referenced many great American writers. After class, a bright young woman came up to me and her sentence began, so I was rereading F. Scott Fitzgerald. I almost fell over. You can imagine. Those might have been the seven best words I've ever heard in an academic session. <laughs> this young woman has gone on to a brilliant career. I knew it then, I knew it from the start. She, everybody knew it. That young woman, in her free time, does all the things that you would imagine an amazing young person does. She runs marathons, she's traveled the world, she still reads widely, she sends me emails asking me what good books that she should be reading. She can do anything that she wants professionally. If I would not be surprised if someday she is the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. I would not be surprised if she opens her own global marketing agency. From my perspective, if my daughter grows up to be like this young woman, I will have done a good job. I will have been a good parent. And I don't want this to seem like doom and gloom. We are the last stand, but I thought I'd leave on a couple uh, good thoughts. Mark Twain is one of the greatest writers in history and one of the most um, cogent thinkers of the American scene. And he said, 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things that you didn't do than by the ones you did do. Sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, discover. Thank you.